Okay. <laughs> Hello, BookTube. Well, as you can see, I have yet another guest. This is Liam from Liam's Lyceum. <laughs> I care to say hello to my imaginary BookTube friends. <laughs> hello, imaginary BookTube friends. <laughs> we have an epic subject to talk about today, uh, sword and sorcery fantasy. And we have an epic setting in which to do so, <laughs> because this is, by random chance, the Day of Might. Care it to is tell people what on earth the day of might is um so it's just a a silly but not right a holiday to celebrate sword and sorcery uh i believe it's the 23rd because the holiday right holiday i don't get off work for this um <laughs> yes. was it was a uh, i believe it's the first day or the maybe the day the first publication of tales from the magician's skull came out the magazine and so that magazine is the one you set up, you know, the holiday, essentially. So they're just like, hey, you should read Sword and Sorcery and, uh, you know, drink mead and uh, or root beer. You know, I have my root beer right here. Um, and yeah, stuff like that. So I don't have any root beer. I don't have a skull. I don't have a red candle. <laughs> I don't have any of those things. I do have this. <laughs> so that Effective. Counts, right? for, <laughs> for the day of might that certainly counts <laughs> it's uh sharp and very old <laughs> so i'm gonna i'm gonna have to rely on that i don't have any of the other props uh but okay so we've got the perfect setting but what is sword and sorcery fiction a lot of people are going to be watching this video who know have no idea what that is hey well a thumbnail description a thumbnail description? Well, or less than a thumbnail, maybe a whole thumb. You're you are <laughs> expert on something. So. Uh, yeah, I'm the resident expert, huh? Uh, well, I'm sure, if, uh, like someone like Michael K. Vaughn probably has read more than me, and at least um, the classic stuff, or maybe not. I imagine he has them. Um, and then you probably read a lot too, just based off your uh, um, the amount of reading you do. But um, what sword and sorcery is is, um, it's it's a fantasy subgenre, right? I mean, it's um, it's it's kind of like Lovecraftian horror, but if you gave the love the Lovecraftian protagonist a sword, and he wasn't a wimp, essentially, um, that's essentially what sword and sorcery is, right? Like in like this, if I could make it like as small as I could, um, there's other things about it, like it's uh, typified by Conan the Barbarian or Conan of Samaria or whatever or Cole, who's also, those are both characters of Robert Howard's. Um, then you kind of have the other big ones they call classics of sword and sorcery these days is Elric of Mel Dibonet by Michael Moorcock, and then uh, Fafran and the Great Mouser by Fritz Leiber. Um, those are like the classic ones. And those, they're, they're actually rather different in a lot of ways. The idea is that originally sword and sorcery had to be like basically Conan and, and just like Conan type stuff. So you had all these clonins, which are you know, depending on who you ask, they're either okay or terrible. Um, and uh, but you know, someone like Elric is very anti Conan. He's very weak and uh, kind of a sorcerer in his own right, actually. And sorcery generally has this negative um, aspect in sword and sorcery. But and then Father the Great Master is funny, All right? So I mean, like, and Conan is very serious. So yeah, and you're you're not extending. Uh, a welcome to Carl Edward Wagner's Kane because you haven't read Kane yet. Is that right? I haven't read Kane. Um, though generally, so I hear the the three are Conan, Fafnir, and Grey Master, and Elric, right? But I also hear if you were to add another three, you generally add Kane by Carl Edward Wagner. You'd add Imero by Charles Saunders, which I have read, and you'd add uh, Jarella Jwari by Seal Moore, which I've also read. Um, so those are like kind of secondary, like classic ones as well, but also really good. Again, I haven't read Kane. Because, you know, I'm just slacking. I have I have Bloodstone right here, actually. So, <laughs> Oh, my. I would say you're in for a treat. I suppose I, on the day of mine, I have to. I'm, com I'm contractually obligated to say you're in for a treat. <laughs> <laughs> Parts of it that aren't so treaty, but maybe not. <laughs> but, uh, the, so basically, the description of what sword and sorcery fiction is, is right there in the pairing of the nouns in the name. Mm-hmm. Is it is do you think that a uh, a fundamental part of the DNA of sword and sorcery is also some sort of relationship between those two? Yeah, yeah. Generally, the sword is, is the sword generally opposed to the sorcery. 
Yes, almost always, uh, not completely, right? I mean, um, again, like I said, Elric is kind of a bit of a sorcerer, and uh, even the Grey Mouser is uh, not, he doesn't, you don't see it that often, but he is. Um, generally, the sorcery, though, just, it doesn't always just mean sorcery, though. It also means eldritch evils and stuff like that, yeah. essentially. So, right. And those swords aren't generally good guys either. They're good comparatively. Uh, right there but they're generally more like gray characters or often they're anti-heroes um or in some cases they're more picaresque um if you're reading something like the dying earth by vance uh right kugel was okay he's pretty sword and sorcerer at least at the start um and he's not a good guy by, by any means so um so what is their appeal do you think if it's not straight up black and white morality could it be that they're effective um in a Good world question. where, I mean, <laughs> if you think, if you go back to Howard, to Robert E. Howard, he's, who's often, you know, often called the father of this yeah. genre of, of fantasy fiction, you could see where he's dreaming of a, a man, in his case, a man who doesn't have to worry about the niceties. And if the supernatural beings and the sorceress, the sorcerers in his stories are stand-ins for all kinds of religious dogma or religious strictures or anything like that his character can just cut right through them quite literally is, is, yeah. is this fiction for suburban dads is that what this is <laughs> is that what this is um you know it it, it kind of i think sword and sorcery has has brought appeal in certain senses i mean like um it's not very black and white but i mean but neither is lord of the rings uh in a lot of i mean like in some respects right in some respects it is in other respects it's not right and normally when we get this black and white idea of fantasy that's like it's more of people trying to copy tolkien and they suck it um <laughs> so um but there are certainly notes of deep moral ambiguity in lord of the rings most people miss them mm -hmm. they're definitely mm -hmm. there including the deepest note of all you know, a, a a character who is the font of wisdom saying nothing is evil at the beginning, even Sauron was not so. <laughs> if that's not moral ambiguity, I, I don't know what is, but, uh, but maybe not. I mean, he certainly he certainly gives it the call to try once he decides to be evil. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I don't know. I think the I think there's appeal there because the idea is. Um, I, I would say we, we don't really live in a world of if there is black and white, good and evil, then there's not much of it um, and uh, or there's none at all. Right. Depending on who you ask um, and uh, or it's all relative or whatever. Right. Um, and so. There is the idea, I feel like, behind sword and sorcery is a lot of it is like, wow, this sucks. I'm going to get through it anyways attempt essentially like I'm I was uh, listening to a little bit of um, Robert e. Howard's The Hour of the Dragon um this morning right and he's essentially just like or this one guy's talking who's like okay well there's nothing you can do essentially and they're like here is what you're up against and comes like oh, okay that's that's cool like i'm gonna do it anyways um and so like that's encouraging maybe you know like no way. Uh, it can be uh, so i mean it's not as depressing as you know grimdark tends to be or something like grimdark um whatever that means no um or like even like cyberpunk i'd say which you know has a tendency to say like oh you can't punch up you know what i mean like you're screwed <laughs> you well, know in sword and sorcery it's more like do it stab it <laughs> characters in sword and sorcery don't actively do evil mm -hmm. never they, they never do that even the anti-heroes ex except maybe i guess you could make you have to make allowances all the time for elric but but other yeah. than that they they don't i mean Conan is a thief, a reaver, and a slayer, but you you don't you don't get the impression that he's a bad guy. He's just not a girl, a boy scout. But, <laughs> but <laughs> it, sorry, there's so many questions here. But before, okay, we we sort of sketched out what sword and sorcery fantasy is. Uh, but now I want to know your origin story with it. What made you fall in love with this? Do you remember the first sword and sorcery stuff that you read? Or even sword and sorcery adjacent? I think we could probably say the John Carter novels of Edgar Rice Burroughs are sword and sorcery adjacent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I came into it from probably an even more adjacent genre. Um, I, I like reading 
maybe this is a mark on my character, but I like reading Dungeons and Dragons fiction. Um, <laughs> and it's not, you know, the greatest literature ever, but a lot of it's, it's very much heroic fantasy. Some of it dips into epic fantasy, but for the most part, it's just heroic fantasy. Um, and some of it is even quite close to sword and sorcery. Um, not a lot. If you're reading Dragonlance, like not at all. But um, right, you know, you've done a good bit of reading of both Dragonlance and Forgotten Realms, right? Uh, more so Forgotten Realms. Um, but I mean, like, yeah, I like I like reading Dungeon Dragons literature. It's just fun. I think. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, there's there's some problems with it, of course. Um, so that was basically how I got into it. I mark probably the most explicit thing that I was like this is kind of cool, I want more stuff like this, which ended up being Sword and Sorcery, was the Erebus Kale novels by Paulus Kemp, which are Forgotten Realms novels. And uh, while they're not quite Sword and Sorcery, you know, they have, you know, like halflings and stuff, which you're not gonna really see ever in Sword and Sorcery, right? Uh, it kind of, it's like thieves on the street, you know, type of thing, right, that's going on. Um and, uh, well, Kemp would later go on to write, like, a more strictly sword and sorcery series called, uh, Aeol and Nyx, or Egel, I don't know, I don't know how he says it, I, I'm just assuming it's Aeol, like the Aeol Scaligrim Sun or something, but, um, and so that's more sword and sorcery, so it's essentially from there, and I was, like, interested in Dungeon Dragons, like, literature as a whole, so Appendix, Appendix N came up, uh, so I read, like, The Dying Earth, which... Depending on who you ask, that might be maybe the first thing that I read that was like explicitly sword and sorcery. Um, but then around the same time, I was reading um, A Princess of Mars, and I read Elric Mel de Bonnet, and the first Conan stories, and uh, Swords and Deviltry by a Liber, like all around the same time. So, wow, <laughs> wow, what an introduction! But unlike unlike a lot of people, I'd say most people who read the you know the the towering works of sword and sorcery or get introduced to them or whatnot you didn't stop there did you you write it yourself yeah <laughs> sword and sorcery fans don't say that they should they should try it but they don't what is that like sword and sorcery was born well really i mean it, it came to full strength in the pulp era right it's not as strong now as it ever has been but yeah it's it's not i mean it's a lot of ways <laughs> So you write sword and sorcery short stories? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, what is the submission world like for <laughs> sword and sorcery short stories? Are there actual paying venues? Uh, yeah, there are, but most of them are. So most that are, I would say probably all that are strictly sword and sorcery, like that's what they want. Um, they're all amateur, yeah, right? Levels of payment. It's either like a flat fee, uh, like. 10 bucks or something uh or it's a cent per word something like that right um which is very low pain it is pain right so it's better than not not being paid at all uh you can sneak in some sword and sorcery um with other venues i i could you could argue like i i have read a sword and sorcery sale uh, tale and beneath Cesar's skies right which does is it six one six cents a word i'm not even sure right now um but essentially it's like yeah, sword and sorcery kind of started essentially in the pulps. It had a little bit of a renaissance, is generally the term they use for it, in the '60s. Um, maybe starting in the late '50s with when like, um, oh, what's her name, Celie Goldsmith, and she had a merry name, I think, later added on there. Uh, when she was editor of Amazing and Fantastic, um, she read the stuff and published it um even doing like a whole like fritz library issue for example um and uh that's is around that time also when like tolkien's getting popular so you have other fantasy writers and then it's i think it was in 66 might have been earlier than that that fritz library coined the term sword and sorcery uh kind of in letters to moorcock but they were also appearing in like uh little fanzines essentially uh, and so there was a good amount from then, but it, in the 80s, it quickly turned into mostly like Kelowna and stuff um, and uh, not not very good. So it kind of went downhill over the 80s. In the 90s, it was essentially non-existent. Um, there was one magazine, and I don't remember what it's called uh, right now, <laughs> um, that would publish stuff like that. And it didn't last very long as far as I'm remembering. But yeah, mostly these days, you're relegated to indie stuff, which is also, you could, it's 
of course, partially based off popularity of the genre. You know, most people want their big epic fat fantasy books and huge series. Uh, sword and sorcery tends to be smaller. It's short stories normally. You're, you get novels, of course, and I've read some good sword and sorcery novels, but they're generally not that thick. <laughs> um, and for some reason, there's this weird idea that I have to read thick books and <laughs> to be a true fantasy reader, at least among some people. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, I, I just, I write it because it's fun. I mean, I like, uh, and you can tell kind of what I was reading around the time I wrote it. Like one of my first sword and sorcery stories is very, very Conan-esque. Right. I try not to make it a Clonan, you know, but like it's very Conan-esque. Um, and some of my later stuff is more like Clark Ashton Smith stuff because I was reading Clark Ashton Smith and that guy is a weirdo. Um, a big and fan, so, you? Yeah, yeah, I like Clark Ashton Smith, but his stuff is really weird. Um, and so just stuff like that. I've just, I'm kind of trying to get like, I don't have much published as far as Sword and Sorcery goes. I have, uh, I had one appear in that booktube anthology, Half Human Heroes, that was edited by Jeremy Fee. Uh, I have one story on whetstone sword and sorceries. Um, it was a flash fiction piece, so it's tiny. It's like 400 words. And then I have one that's actually got accepted for publication from them just this last week. That should come out in issue eight. And I had another story accepted for publication of sword and sorcery like way back in February, <laughs> but it hasn't seen publication yet. And we'll see if that happens. But um. Yes, I well remember. <laughs> I well remember submitting fiction. Gets accepted. You do a jig in your room summer turns into fall fall turns into winter <laughs> and it still hasn't appeared and people are starting to think you made it up <laughs> how do you go about it if you don't mind a kind of how the sausage are made question how do you go about writing this particular subgenre that that does not have right now a standard bear in the mainstream press i assume does not have a large readership in in the mainstream press when when you sit down to do something like this to write a short story, you have you have recurring characters, do you not? Um, yeah, for most of stories. Yeah, yeah. I does that help? That also is a hallmark of the subgenre. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that's very true. Of course, Conan appears in a bunch of stuff, and Network and Pop and Gray Mouse are essentially all of them, right? Jarvel Jari, they're all just short stories that have the same character, um, essentially. Um, yeah, I've mostly written, I think of all the stories I've written, I think I've written eight from one character I, I named Arian, and then like maybe three or four from another character named Renata, and then, well, my longest thing I wrote was a novella, actually, which is not published, uh, but, uh, and that, that stars Renata, um, but then at the same time, I just kind of, I don't know, so I, I write, I try to write every day, okay, and you know I'm not as good at this as I should be. Uh, and uh, you know, it, trying. most people don't try. <laughs> yeah, it, it kind of ebbs and flows. Sometimes I'm really good at it. I do write every day, or really often at least. And other times it's like I don't write very much at all. But uh, um, I have a tendency to be inspired in a lot of cases to like write a story. I'll just like for whatever reason I'll be like I should write the story, and so I'll just go and write it in like you know one sitting, um, and. Uh, it's it it's that's why it's actually hard for me to sit down and just be like I'm gonna write right now because then I'm just like what am I forcing on the page is this even good <laughs> like because other times it's like escaping from me it's like ah oh, I gotta write this like right now or else I'm gonna forget about it or something and it's just not gonna work the way it should if I just sit down on my computer right now and write it so um yeah it's it turns out I don't know like it's I'm not a big name I mean if you were to argue like you could say that maybe. Howard Andrew Jones is like the big name of Sword and Sorcery. Okay. Because he's actually published by Bain now. Um, but he's been going, he's been doing, he's been writing for a long time and he's always had very Sword and Sorcery adjacent or stuff that is just very much Sword and Sorcery. Yeah, he's he's sent uh, copies of his new book to everybody on BookTube, everybody on YouTube. The Crockery Channel's got copies. The Mailman got copies. <laughs> I didn't get a copy, but everybody else did. I, I, go, I go out on the street, I see random passersby carrying a <laughs> copy that he sent them, but not me. <laughs> but I'm not the sour grapes or anything. <laughs> I'm curious to know, though, getting back to, uh, because you're you're actually in the game. You're not just writing these things for your own entertainment. You're also shopping them around. And mm -hmm. I'm curious to know, there aren't any major mainstream venues for sword and sorcery fiction, right? It's all, you use the word amateur. Mm-hmm. It's it's all 
if we don't use the word amateur, it's certainly small stakes. It's it's indie publishers of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people who, um, that you could get to know. The, the the shop is run by three people, so you could get to know them. <laughs> yeah, oh, you can definitely get to know them. I mean, there are some that I did. I guess I did forget to mention that they do publish, but they're just I don't know like how often. Like I I can't remember the last time I saw an open call for Tales from Magician School, and I'm not sure how much they pay either. Uh, their writers, uh, the quality of the max is really good. Um, and then like New Edge Sword and Sorcery is all invites, you know, but they, so they kind of got like, they get paid well, right? But it was Kickstarter pay, right? Like people put money in and so they got paid their eight cents a word or, or more or whatever. Um, there is actually a new, a new magazine on the block that I did forget about as well called Old Moon Quarterly. And while they're not, they're not 100% sword and sorcery, uh, they're kind of in a lot of ways more dark fantasy. But the door's um, not closed. Yeah, I mean, I, they do mention them, that they're a sword and sorcery venue. Um, but some of the stuff I read there is like, yeah, it's kind of dark fantasy. And, but a lot of times when you're writing fantasy in short story form, it comes out more sword and sorcery anyways, because you're not writing a big epic novel, right? So, um, yeah, so An Old Moon's good. I've read all five of their issues. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so, but you can, but I know all of them, essentially. Like, Howard Andrew Jones is the guy who does Tales from Magician School, and I've talked to Howard you know, a couple times at least. Uh, I talked to him once, I think, like we are right now. Um, and then, you know, a decent amount online uh, on like Discord and stuff. And it's then, a very good looking production. Yeah, no, it is. It's, I know this I from don't... far. I have not received any copy for review, <laughs> but, I, but I know that this seems to be a common thread going through this, but, but, but I know it from afar. Uh, but I, the reason I asked about, you know, two or three people running the shop is because I'm wondering if that changes the submissions process. I mean, if you if the people are so hands on and involved, if there are only so few of them, do you get a stronger sense from that of what kind of thing they're looking for? And also, would that matter to you? Would, uh, you, would you write what you write, regardless of what they're looking for? Um, yeah, you definitely get a sense of what they want uh, and what they're looking for, you know, in some ways, just by reading what they're publishing. Uh, in other ways, just because you read what they write themselves. And most of these guys that are editing and publishing these things also write, of course, right? right? Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's just, and they have their own, you know, quirks, right? Like uh, like Savage Realms Monthly has terrible covers, right? I mean, like, <laughs> it's just like, but they consistently put out, you know, decent stories. Um, and then, you know, Old Moon Quarterly, they very much do that dark fantasy vibe. It's very much feels almost like a uh, between two fires, like Christopher Buellman. I feel like I read a lot of stories that are kind of like that in there. Um, but yeah, you get like I write whatever I want, regardless. Though, like, so I mean, I say that, and I and the story that got accepted for publication, um, three people read it this time, um, and uh, two of the people that read it were basically like, I think this would work better in like the cos their cosmic horror magazine, and I was like, okay, that's interesting. Um, it like looking at the comments, it looks like a rejection, uh, <laughs> but they accepted it. So, um, and so I'm just like, huh, okay, but I mean. Or in most, I've never got a story accepted in Old Moon, though I've submitted to I think all but one of their open calls, and uh, I always make their long list. And the thing they always reject me for for is because I don't. I've always almost submitted Aryan stories to them as well. I think I have actually the entire time. Uh, they don't get enough of Aryan's thoughts, and so they want more of that, right? And I'm just like, well, Aryan doesn't share his thoughts with you, and that's on purpose. You know what I mean? Like I wrote, that's I wrote the it this way. I was talking about so. that's a very hands-on <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, reading of your thing. That's that's very different from. I'm sorry, this is not our minimum length. That's yeah. Here's a, here's a storytelling element that you, the mm -hmm. writer, should add to your story. Does that come about because all the editors are also writers? Uh, that might be. I guess what I, I'm trying to say is that, you know, mainstream magazines don't workshop your stuff. Yeah. They, they, they tell you whether or not it's, they'll take it, but they don't, they don't dig inside the story and say, you need more of X or Y element. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know if that is, I mean, it sounds like that, is, that has been your experience across the board with submitting. Yeah. With the sword and sorcery places, they do tend to give more specific feedback. If it's, if I'm submitting a sword and sorcery story to a place that, you know, maybe just maybe we'll accept it you know the chances are very slim they'll just give you the you know the form rejection like oh thanks we don't want it um and uh 
for whatever reason, you never know why they reject it, right? Um, and the same, it's interesting. I mean, personally, I find it sometimes it's like, it's helpful to know what they want. I'm so stubborn though. Uh, and so like, I generally just don't, I don't care anyways. Like I know, like I, I've gotten to the point where I'm like, old moon's opening. Uh, maybe I shouldn't send an area in the story. And not just because I don't like, they don't want them, you know, essentially, right? Like, I mean, I could write Ari in the way they want me to write Ari, but I don't want to. <laughs> and so, like, maybe that would get me published there. Um, and, you know, that's 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 fine, you know, like, they want to publish what they want to publish, of course. They're going to buy whatever they like. Um, and so if they want characters that, you know, are thinking more on the page, essentially, or at least thinking out, out loud on the page, right, this inner monologue or feelings or whatever, um, then... You know, like that's them. You know, this other publication over here might like it just as much so as it is. So And could you uh for viewers, could you uh go over the names of these venues again? You're you're mentioning uh, passing in conversation, but could we could we go over them specifically? What they are like just list them or do you want me to go like, like just tell just you who they are? Clearly name them. They're they're coming right. up in conversation, but I don't think they're I don't think they're clear to viewers. Okay, yeah. Uh, Whetstone Sword and Sorcery magazine is a good one. Are um, any of these physical print magazines? Whetstone is not. Um, Tales of Magician Skull is. Uh, they come out with probably an average of two issues a year. Um, they don't take submissions that often, though. Um, and then Old Moon Quarterly is physical. Um, New Edge Sword and Sorcery is physical. Um, Swords and Sorcery magazine might be swords and sorceries i don't know there's a magazine called just swords and sorcery i think uh that is not physical it's all digital um heroic fantasy quarterly will take sword and sorcery as well they're digital but they do like bind ups um you know okay. every you know once in a while of stories from different issues or whatever um savage realms monthly uh is not monthly as far as i'm aware um but they'll do physical like print on demand type of stuff um and uh I'm sure I'm forgetting others like anthologies are pretty common too so you'll just get like I think Die by the Sword is by DMR they just had their first issue anthology of Die by the Sword came out uh, earlier this year um there are more than I thought that's more venues than I thought do all of those pay at least something I think so yeah I mean because Whetstone will do a base ten dollars and Swords and Sorcery will do a base ten dollars uh Starward Shadows is another one. They're digital only, and they've been kind of on a hiatus, but they'll do a cent a word. Um, Old Moon is actually eight cents a word. Um, they didn't start out that high, but they're eight cents a word, which is, you know, what people want. <laughs> so, like, um, but is that, uh, is that uh, does that money come from subscriptions? Do these things have ads? Or... I don't know. Any idea I don't know where, they're they're where that money <laughs> comes from? Usually it's ads, but yeah, it. I can't imagine you would yeah. sell ads on a digital on a digital product. Well, Old Moon does do physical, but they don't have at least so far they haven't had any ads in there. Like their physical books are more like chat books type of thing. They don't have typical magazine stuff. New Edge, for example, does have ads in theirs, and so does Tales from Magician Skull. Um, okay, so so does your knowledge of the sort of the cycle of when they will be open, when they're looking for things, does your knowledge of that affect? You're writing. Do you ever steer <laughs> a little bit. back in the spring and think, you know, in the early summer they're going to they're going to have an open call? It'd be nice if I had something new by then. Yeah, yeah, it does a little bit. Um, like for example, uh, there's an anthology that's open right now, um, closes on November first, and so I was like, I need to write a short, <laughs> like a sort of sorcery story, uh, for that. It's called Heathens and Heroes. It's by Three Ravens Publishing, um, and so I was like, I need to write something for that, and. Or like Whetstone, I almost always write a new story for Whetstone when they open up. Um, they opened up in like August, I think, and closed in September. And so I wrote a story for them. And this one finally got accepted, of course. But uh, and yeah, so it does affect me. In some ways, it won't. I'll sit. I'll always sit there and be like, I should write something, but doesn't mean I will. Um, but sometimes I do. And even with the the schedule of open calls in front of you, at some point, the stubbornness you mentioned still crops up. Is that right? So you'll you'll say, well, there's an opening here. I should write something for them, but still the thing I want, not necessarily the thing they want. <laughs> yeah. Well, I a lot of stuff you can work around. I mean, if you so like another magazine's like Hexagon, which I don't think they do physical at all. 
and they're not strictly sword and sorcery. They just they're they'll basically right before they open for calls, they'll be like, This is what we want this month. And you can fit a lot of sword and sorcery stuff in there normally. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I mean like and it's very vague. It's like we want frozen wastelands or something like that. Right. Because like, they're building a theme. Yeah. And so I'm like, I can fit that into a story, no problem, essentially. Like some of those, right? Like I'm not gonna feel all stubborn, you know. But when I, for example, I'm just being picky when I write Aryan stories. I'm like, maybe they suck, right? I mean, one did get accepted for publication. That's the one that you know hasn't come out. Um, but uh, you know, I'm just like, that's the way I want to write them. You know what I mean? Like that's the character. Like those are that's the point of the stories. If I change it the way you want me to, it's not the same story anymore. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm stubborn. But uh, um, I don't know. Yeah. What What actually happened to uh? or if you know, to Dragonlance and Forgotten Realms. Those were staples. <laughs> and in retail bookstores, they used to come in at regular intervals and there were people waiting for them. Why, what caused that that just complete, that well to dry up? Um, well, I, it's not on the authors. It was, it oh, was no. definitely on no, it's not on the authors. Hasbro. Uh, the same thing happened with Star Trek. With Star yeah. Trek. It, just, it just all but disappeared. Conan pastiche novels, all but gone. Yeah. Well, actually, you're getting those, a few uh, short stories have been coming out this last month for Conan Pastiche, but um, I haven't read any of them yet. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the Forgotten Realm stuff and like Dragonlance stuff is mostly because, well, Hasbro's owned Wizards of Coast for a while, I think, but essentially in some points in the last decade, probably about 10 years ago, if I were to guess, um, they're essentially like, they just don't make us any money. <laughs> and so, uh, the only way oh, you Hasbro, can get... the toy company, own both of yes, them? Yes, they own Wizards of the Coast, and so that's who Wizards owns... of the Coast is owned by them. Yes, and that is who has Dragonlance and Forgotten Realms and everything. Um, and so they're like, you know, Hasbro essentially will do that, uh, as far as I'm aware. And so essentially they're just like, okay, well, we'll publish out these last couple novels, probably ones they had contracts for, right? Um, I think 2016 is when the last like normal ones came out. Dragonlance had kind of died a few years before that, but like Forgotten Realms has some coming out to 2016, but one was like by Ed Greenwood, who's pretty staple, like he's a staple in Forgotten Realms. And then one was by Aaron Evans and it was her sixth book in her series and the final one, right? So she's probably just finishing out her series. And then basically since then, it's only been Drist. Um, and then they had a couple for the movie uh, and they announced one, you know, like last week, I think that should come out next year. Um, we'll see if that's any good. But uh, um, essentially, the idea now is that it has to be published by someone else. Wizards of the Coast will no longer publish the novels. That. So, so Wizards of the Coast have have conventions in which it's $100 a head just to walk through the front door. How can money be an issue? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I'm really frustrated with the fact that they closed down those novel lines because uh, to me, it doesn't make any sense. And they're asking right. authors to be dumb, essentially, to be like, hey, write a novel in my universe. And if I like it enough, if you can get a publisher for it, <laughs> then I might I might approve it for you. And then so I can make some money off of you. Um, so it's so stupid. It. <laughs> Wizards of the Coast just this summer packed, what, 15,000 incels into one auditorium. That There's there's money there <laughs> that's that's strange for these things to just disappear yeah i think it is oh i mean maybe i could see like cutting back on the number they published you know if if they thought it wasn't like lucrative enough for them but just stopping altogether just doesn't seem to make any sense to me so so how how closely to your own heart is the crafting of your own sword and sorcery when when i mean you have you have an active there's an active part of your life that's devoted to writing god bless it that that should be true for everybody who's listening to me not many people do that but do you ever feel the call to other kinds of let's say fantasy like do you ever yes. do you ever feel tempted to cross over to the dark side and write book one of one <laughs> <laughs> no no not that at all <laughs> um like i said the longest thing i've written is a novella and it is sword and sorcery um, it's like science fantasy but sword and sorcery still i'd say um i like short stories a lot i i really i just like writing them i it feels very satisfying when i'm finished with them it feels more satisfying when they get published of course <laughs> um, um but you know i've finished a lot more than i've had published at least as of right now right so um and i sword and sorcery is just there's a lot to explore i feel like there. um um like, I'd like to be able to write more like Liber, but I'm just not, 
I don't have the verve of Liber, right? Um, and I'm not as witty for that matter. Um, but uh, nor am I well, just a dude bro, kind of like Liber's characters are. But uh, he, was <laughs> a, he was as dull as a boot when he was your age. <laughs> so let's keep things in perspective. <laughs> but, uh, but I think you're absolutely right when you say there's so much to be done. One of the curses of sword and sorcery fantasy is to have a whole brace of towering figures right at its birth. Mm, they sort of yeah. the whole thing sort of imprinted on them like a chick. There's a whole bunch of other stuff you could do that isn't Liber or Conan. But <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, but you're also I, I I was I was nodding in sympathy there when you mentioned there. I mean there is a, a particular thrill in finishing a work, any work. If you write short stories, you get that thrill several times a year instead of <laughs> once every five years. <laughs> that that I can see the attraction there. Right. Yeah. No. And that that's probably actually part of the reason I do write short stories. At least, um, because when I was younger, I did try to write novels and I just never finished them. And so I was like, one day I was like, I want to finish writing a story, and so I'm going to write a short story. And it turned out you know probably be one of my longer ones that i've ever written it was fan fiction for the most part what you would call fan fiction because it was set in the forgotten realms right and i was like and since they're not publishing anything anything that's written is just fan fiction <laughs> so um so but it was nice finishing it right and i have since filed off those barcodes uh right um but uh and just you know tried to use it elsewhere uh, but you know first thing i finished so not that great but <laughs> What if I mean this 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 takes us a little afield from sword and sorcery to writing itself, but you write sword and sorcery, so we're not we're not that far afield. And I'm wondering what since you you're practiced at it, you're not new anymore at the whole process of doing it, what shape does that process take for you? Does a plot come to you, the rough outline of a plot or a particular scene that you definitely want so you'll build a story around it? Or or is it if you have a recurring character, is it more a, more a case of that? You know, that I want to, to see what's up with this character. I want to check in with this character. Yeah, um, it's a lot of those, I'd say. I mean, sometimes I'm like, oh, that's a fun plot, you know, or whatever. Like, let's see if that turns into anything. Um, and it is with the characters I do like. I like Arian. I think he's nutty and I just like, you know, writing him. Um, because I'll just write whatever comes to mind, you know. Um, and uh, And I like that. That's fun. Right. Or and it's the same thing with Renata. I like revisiting Renata as well. And so it's just but other times it's like I want to evoke a mood in some ways. So um my one flash fiction piece okay, not it's not my only flash fiction piece, my only sort of sorcery flash fiction piece that's been published on Whetstone's website that you know anyone could go read for free. Um on what all I wanted was a mood there. Uh, it's called Amidst a Amidst a Sleeping Castle. Um What was the and, website though? What, uh, whetstone um whetstone their, their website's always confusing me it's like whetstone mag or something like that at blog spot it's it's a blog spot one if i always just look up whetstone sword and sorcery because there's two magazines called whetstone and one is about food so <laughs> um, <laughs> um but yeah so and that, that was very much a mood right i just wanted a mood to come through and the same with some of my other stories i'm just like i want this to be like weird or something like the the one that got accepted by whetstone recently right uh i was like i want to write a philologist into sword and sorcery um and i was like i could do this philology in, like, is a passion of yours yes. yes yeah i like philology a lot i was like i could do this in like you 